so Patrick, welcome. Um, so Patrick is the co-founder and CEO of Stripe. Uh, he launched the startup, or now pretty big company, in 2010, correct? Um, with his brother, John. Well, actually, we started working on it full-time in 2010, but it actually, to your uh, comment just there about companies yeah. launching, uh, it took us quite a while to launch because we had to get all these kind of banking partnerships in place and so on. And so we didn't launch until September 2011. Uh, we'd been working on it for almost two years uh, uh, at, at that point. And, uh, and every time we saw PG or really anyone else from YC, uh, all they would ask us is why we had not launched yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, some things don't change. <laughs> um, that's interesting. So two years until you had to... Yeah, it was, I think, uh, w one year and, uh, and 11 months from sort of first line of code to public launch. Which, to be clear, I, I don't recommend. Uh, that is not a good idea. Uh, it's just we, we had to because we had to kind of get all these other things in place. And because uh, it sort of took us to, uh, so long to be able to publicly launch, we were sort of, uh, we tried to be kind of very disciplined about sort of gradually expanding the number of users uh, every month. And so even though we weren't publicly available, uh, we, we, we got our first user, like first production user, just kind of three months in. Uh, and then kind of every month we tried to add at least kind of a handful of users. Uh, and so by the time we publicly launched, uh, we, we, we did have you know, about 100 users, which, I mean, back then to us seemed, that, that seemed like a, a big deal. That seemed very, very large. Um, speaking of, I actually, when I was preparing for this interview, I, um, I was trying to jog my memories. And I remember specifically because your office was near here in Palo Alto. And I remember back then, um, people would always talk about the Collison brothers running around, going to people's offices and like installing their API into the web apps and, you know, in true do things don't scale fashion. Um, and I assume you are not only trying to make sure they installed it, but also get user feedback. Um, and it happens so much that actually, I don't know if you know, Paul Graham, PG, now calls it the Collison installation. <laughs> and this is actually something we give, uh, we tell founders to go do this, do the Collison installation, um, because obviously, you know, it, in hindsight, it seems so obvious to do. Well, it, it sort of served two purposes. Uh, one is, to your point, uh, I mean, it served as a really good way to kind of get um, sort of um, to, to do user research and to get kind of UX feedback and so on. And I mean, if you've done this, I'm sure you've had the experience where you design what you're absolutely certain is the most streamlined, user-friendly, straightforward, frictionless way to, you know, do whatever it is the product does. Uh, and then you kind of, you you you, um, you pr present it and kind of put it in front of a, a user and you just kind of ask them to do whatever it is. And, you know, they, they find it completely impenetrable and like they're clicking all the wrong links and you know, they can't find the next button even though the next button is they're blinking and green and stuff. Um, uh, and so it, it, it's invariably sort of incredibly painful, uh, the, the sort of nothing so sobering um, as, as watching somebody use kind of the, the first version of, um, of, you know, some new product. Um, but the other reason uh, for us was, uh, you know, we, we would suggest to somebody they, they use Stripe or they switch to Stripe or whatever. And, you know, invariably the response is, oh, yeah, sure, that sounds awesome. Um, but, you know, it can be that they'll postpone it and they'll postpone it again. And just like there's never a moment where it's like, OK, this is the evening where I'm going to switch to Stripe. Uh, and so us going and uh, sort of um, accosting them in person uh, sort of helped, you know, uh, you know, people talk about in sales. It's always like, a, you know, a why you and a why this and a why now and uh, th th these kinds of questions. Um, and uh, and going in person kind of created a why now moment. It's like, well, we're here at your house. Did you just show up or how did you? Like, I don't, I don't think it? we ever actually just showed up, um, although you know, perhaps we should have. But um, no, we, 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 um, we, we, we tried to, uh, to uh, be kind of um, at least semi-invited. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, so, so Stripe now today, I mean, you've come a long way since back then. I mean, it's not even been, it's really been a decade, not even. Um, but I mean, today you're, well, you have 1,300 employees across nine offices across the world. You're doing, I have a list here. Um, you manage 200 million API requests a day. You process billions a year for millions of companies across 130 companies. And your latest round of funding, Stripe is now worth $20 million. <laughs> Billion. <laughs> um, anyway, the list could go on. I'm not going. Uh, um, I'll stop there. Although, otherwise, people are going to think I'm your PR agent. Uh, but anyway, you've clearly done something right. Um, and so, I want to spend a lot of, I guess, the time today talking about um, running your startup um, from the perspective of the startup CEO, you yourself. Um, and it's kind of like Zoom. Like, what what do you think about? from zooming in on the day-to-day -day operations to zooming out to the long-term strategic decisions. Um, so maybe to help us ease into the discussion, uh, one thing is, you know, when you start off, you know, when from the very beginning, a lot of friends get together and they come up with an idea and they're super excited and they start working on it. And then at some point they need to decide, 
ah, we need a CEO for this company. Um, and some people, you know, aren't meant to be CEOs. Uh, but for you and John, you know, I've met both of you. You're very smart, ambitious people with great, you know, qualities that and attributes that correlate to becoming a great leader. How did you and John decide you would be the CEO? Well, I think Stripe is unusual for, uh, you know, John and I are obviously brothers. Uh, uh, we've um, uh, known each other for a long time, um, and uh, uh, and and you know, be, be, because of the relationship, uh, we're able to sort of place a lot of trust in each other, um, and uh, uh, and we really do run the company together. Um, there, there's no major decision that sort of Stripe has made uh, that sort of um, that we've not both been been a part of, uh, and, and and you know, it's not always the case that you know. Despite being the CEO, the kind of I'm the person who, like, in the case of disagreement, it's not all. It's not all the case that I prevail. Uh, sort of our our kind of dispute resolution framework um, is kind of much more around which of us cares more um, uh, than kind of which of us holds this title or that. And I mean, John's title is president, and so you know, it, it, there's kind of some. I don't know, <laughs> both are significant roles. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, yeah, in, in that regard, I think we're kind of an anomaly. Sort of, uh, you know. The fact that I became CEO was honestly semi-random, um, and uh, and I would say, yeah, I, th I, th I think because we're, we're brothers, we're able to kind of get to this unusual situation where we we really do run it together. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain? Which sorry, it may not be a helpful answer because perhaps you're trying to encourage all these companies. It's like you know, <laughs> shit. One of you guys has got to be the uh, the, the CEO. But um, well, do you think there's like a rubric for this? Of you know, here are five questions you should answer, and maybe then you decide. That's a good question. Um, hmm. Maybe not. It, yeah, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's quite um, okay. Well, here, here, I will say one thing, which is I, I think it is important to just have an efficient mechanism for reaching a decision, um, and it can't be sort of uh, uh, you know s simply oriented around consensus, right? Uh, if there are sort of three co-founders uh, and sort of none of you sort of quite want to, or, or you know. No, there's no, nobody's a clear CEO and you don't have some kind of efficient mechanism for sort of um, uh, having decisions get made. I think that is a recipe for failure. Uh, and, uh, and and even, I don't know, do, doing some kind of, um, you know, sort of quasi-democratic voting is probably not a great idea either. Um, and so um, so for, for myself and John, we kind of both have areas we kind of respectively specialize in. Um, and so that doesn't mean we kind of have absolute autonomy and authority there, but sort of we, we kind of bias in that direction. Uh, so he spends more time, for example, working externally with users. I spend more of my time working sort of internally on a lot of you know, product and engineering things. That, that, that's not to say that he doesn't make decisions there or I don't hear, but again, there's a bias in that direction. And then secondly, we have this kind of additional aspect where, um, uh, you know, in, in the case of there being a major de decision uh, and, um, uh, we, we sort of respectively disagree, uh, then, then we really do sort of try to make it based on sort of which of us is, kind of, is just more passionate about it. And because that, that, that will correlate with the outcome. If one of us really wants to do something uh, or, or thinks that you know, X or Y is the right thing to do, simply sort of wanting it to be so passionately is more, I mean, that, that can be kind of a, a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's kind of not irrational to have that be a, a consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also, see, I also see like the best teams that work well together are the ones in which Everyone, um, they they all want the best idea to win, not their idea to win. Um, and so there's a stepping back and an un unselfish kind of way to uh, to get to that conclusion. Definitely, um, and I think that uh, you know something that we're kind of lucky about that I think uh, is uh, very well exactly to your point. I think is definitely present in sort of the most successful co-founding relationships that I've seen um, is some degree of sort of dispassion in disagreement. Um, and, you know, for us, I think that was, you know, kind of easier to get to because, you know, we'd been disagreeing with, with each other for 20 years. Uh, and so it had lost some of the emotional charge. Um, um, uh, but I think that sort of finding other mechanisms whereby you can get there such that it's not sort of this, um, I don't know, this kind of, the, but the notion of disagreeing strongly is not sort of a scary phenomenon. And the kind of uh, both parties or you know, multiple parties, if there are more than two, uh, are kind of suppressing their feelings yeah. for fear of, of, um, of there being this uh, you know, divergence. You have, how many more siblings do you have? Do you have one more brother? Uh, one more sibling, yes. Uh, okay. so three, three of us in total. Would you guys, would he join the, <laughs> or is it just you and John, or the, that's, that's a special match there? Well, he, uh, the uh, Tommy, my my uh, youngest sibling, uh, he's he's sort of quite a bit younger than myself and John, and so um, uh, you know, J John is almost 
um, uh, uh, or is approximately two, two years younger than I am. Um, and you know, when we started Stripe, uh, I guess I was about 21, and I think, I guess, therefore, John was 19. Um, and um, uh, and Tommy was you know, still kind of d definitively midway through high school, and so uh, it just wasn't quite practical at the time. Yes, finished high school. And now I think, you know, if you asked him, he'd probably say he'd never throw his lot in with, you know, <laughs> m miscreants like us. Yeah. Um, cool. So in terms of the role of the CEO, often people say there, there's, a, there's a threshold in time in which, and it's related to product market fit, where you have a role as a pre-product market fit CEO, and then which is completely different from your role as a post-product market fit CEO. Um, so I want to spend most of our time talking about pre-product market fit, but um, just to calibrate those questions, what in terms for Stripe, what was product market fit for you? Like, how did you define it? Were there metrics to it? What number of employees you were at when you reached it, so on and so forth? Yeah, that's a really good question, um, and I think you're exactly right to kind of divide things into sort of um, like the, those kind of uh, the story of a startup is two stories. Um, uh, it's a story of getting to product market fit, and then the story of kind of what happens subsequently. And obviously, there isn't like a totally definitive binary line between them, but I think it's kind of helpful to frame the the narrative in that regard. Uh, and I would say for Stripe, um, actually, around the time we launched publicly, um, I, I think is is basically when we had it, uh, in that we, we uh, when we launched publicly in September 2011, um, uh, you know, we, we'd kind of rebuilt significant components of Stripe kind of multiple times in response to user feedback. Like, we're kind of on the third version of our dashboard and the second or third, depending on how you count, major version of our API. And so we, we'd kind of gone through a lot of iteration response to kind of the, you know, um, evident challenges that user ha users had or the deficiencies the product um, uh, you know, seemed to possess. Uh, and and when we launched, um, uh, we're, we were basically immediately bottlenecked on sort of being able to serve user demand rather than generating user demand. Uh, and I think sort of directionally, that's kind of the 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 sort of the inversion that happens, where sort of you know in the early days, you're sort of really trying to figure out, well, okay, kind of you know conditioned on or given some user, how do I make sure that it's if it does what they need and you know, they end up a happy retained user in a, you know, a sufficient fraction of cases or whatever. Um, uh, and then kind of at some point it flips where, okay, uh, the sort of, um, well, uh, you know, I, I think it's kind of very different. Uh, do you sort of take, um, you know, 100 users and, you know, uh, some fraction of them on board and some smaller fraction, you know, remain engaged or whatever. And so kind of 100 users, the curve sort of, uh, sort of asymptotes downwards. And then you take 100 users and kind of, uh, Again, a meaningful fraction end up engaged, and they actually tell more people about it, or they sort of invite people. And I don't mean kind of strictly just in a viral sense, but just kind of generally speaking, does that kind of lead to and generate more demand, such that things seem to be sort of, um, uh, sort of, um, in some super linear fashion, kind of growing. Uh, and I think when you sort of like being kind of less than one is just very different to being more than one. <laughs> and it sort of seems, again, when we launched, I mean, that didn't generate that many users. Um, I mean, I don't exactly remember, but let's just pretend that sort of 500 businesses signed up on, on the day we launched. But sort of immediately, those 500 businesses told other businesses, and people heard about it and all the rest. So kind of the next day, we had a lot of businesses as well, and, and so forth, such that from the day we launched, the challenge became um, uh, keeping up with demand rather than tweaking the product to somehow s serve the market. When you launched, how many people were you at at that point, employees? Uh, we were about 10. 10. Okay. So I guess before you launched then, um, like your day-to-day -day sounds like it was just like we were talking about earlier, just running around talking with users and um, fixing issues. Um, w was that literally every single day was it like that? Um, or what were you doing every day? No, okay, so, so, so not literally every single day, but I would say um, uh, we we really tried very hard to understand in sort of very granular detail um, uh, what exactly it was that people were doing, you know, where they were tripping up and so on. So just you know, to give you some examples, uh, we had a chat room uh, uh, for sort of providing support uh, when people were integrating Stripe. Um, and it was, a, it was actually a public chat room, which kind of had some downsides because, you know, if you know, we'd bro broken something or if somebody had some kind of embarrassing issue, sort of everyone would see it. But we thought that was kind of good because it would actually kind of put more pressure on us to sort of have, have the product be good. Um, 
we had a, li literally every time, uh, sort of for the first, I don't know, call it 10 users of Stripe, every time somebody sent an API request to Stripe, uh, uh, like it sent an email to us. So we were like looking at every single API request. <laughs> um, and you know, if we saw users do something weird, we're like, well, why did they do that, right? Or kind of where were our docs confusing or whatever? And so, you know, I'd get out of dinner in the evening or something and I'd you know, <laughs> Well, again, it seemed like a lot of the time I'd have, you know, maybe 10 emails because Stripe was not handling a lot of API requests back then. But, but sort of, you're literally looking at sort of each individual action. And actually, Stri Stripe, um, we, we just kind of um, celebra celebrated or at least passed. We're not very good at celebrating, but we passed our seventh anniversary um, uh, just, uh, you know, a, a few days ago uh, on, on September 29th. Um, and so I was looking at our sort of, uh, we, we had an hourly stats email that we used to send. Um, and, uh, and so on the day we launched, we handled uh, sort of 22 payments in the previous hour, uh, which again sort of seemed huge to us uh, uh, back then. But I was noticing in that email, I'd actually forgotten this, that we had things like, um, in, the, in the email we literally had a list of businesses that had submitted um, three or five or something uh, API requests, but it sort of not gone live. They'd not launched their businesses. We literally just had the emails of all these businesses. Uh, the, the idea was that we would then kind of, we would literally individually reach out to them. It's like, hey, you kind of seemed to use Stripe a little bit, but you know, you didn't, um, uh, you didn't go live. Like, did we screw up or, you know, was the product somehow inadequate or whatever? Um, we did things like every time anyone ever hit an error um, of, of, of any sort, uh, that generated like a high priority email to us. Um, and so we would sort of try to immediately go solve it. Um, uh, and that also kind of generated sort of, I think, this, um, this uh, pleasant kind of user experience where, I mean, you know, it's frustrating when you hit an error in some service, but we could then often sort of 15 minutes later reach out to them and say, hey, uh, uh, we saw that you sort of encountered this problem. It, 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 it's it's all fixed now. And sometimes we did that even in the case where sort of um, the user just made a silly mistake and that you know they kind of mistyped an API parameter or something. And we just reach out to them and be like, "Hey, noticed you uh, you had a typo in your code," uh, which you know perhaps to some of them was a little bit unsettling, but um, <laughs> um, but but at least kind of helped us uh, you know increase the kind of the, the throughput of product feedback. But so I mean these are all kind of examples I would say of the sort of general pattern of um, sort of really trying to be kind of hyper attentive to all the micro details of sort of what people were doing the product and kind of iterating rapidly in response to it. Um, and generally speaking, I think that sort of pre-product market fit, metrics are actually relatively unhelpful. Um, uh, I think you sort of, you really want to bias very strongly towards kind of as much um, sort of inspection and kind of uh, high throughput qualitative feedback as possible because probably you know, not that many people are using your product, right? And so you know, if, if it's 20 users, you can kind of in some sense afford to just like look at everything they're doing uh, and try to understand kind of you know, what's working, what isn't. Yeah, in some sense, it's how much do they, you, you can tell um, subjectively like how much they love your product or how much are they gonna probably be really upset if it just disappears. Totally, and actually on this point, we had a thing at the bottom of every web page. Um, we had a little uh, sort of text box um, kind of uh, anchored to the bottom of the, uh, of the sort of, um, of the browser frame. Um, and, uh, and sort of, was, you know, kind of one line high sort of text input, um, but we had placeholder text in it uh, to sort of try to prime people to, to tell us things. Uh, and so it had, uh, you know, my, uh, my favorite part uh, of Stripe is ellipsis, and you know people just you know, fill it out um, uh, and can hit enter. Now, but we also, of course, had you know mo most of the prompts were negative. Uh, it was you know like the worst thing about Stripe is, or <laughs> the worst thing about this page is, or I really hate the way Stripe does, um, or whatever. And uh, and again, we would sort of you know sort of at that stage, you have to be kind of masochistic, and so again, we'd be sort of always waking up to you know all, the, all these emails of you know telling us all the terrible things about Stripe. Um, but that that was you know sort of a helpful to do list for the day. Ahead. How did you stay happy if, like in the early days, I mean, for every startup, it's like I've always complaints. What yeah. makes you think we did? Um, <laughs> uh, so um, it was, um, I would say it was, well, happy is such a squishy concept, right? <laughs> um, uh, and because, um, like, there, there are lots of things that we, or I guess, when I look back, um, and look, maybe this is the rationalization I taught myself, but when I look back um, uh, sort of through life at the things that I'm sort of most glad I did, um, I wasn't exactly happy while doing them. Like often I was very stressed out or uh, you know, I had to work really hard or, or whatever, but sort of they're the things that kind of post hoc uh, brought the most fulfillment. Um, and uh, uh, and you know, I, th I think that uh, well, you know, whatever. There's, there's a rich literature here, and so I won't kind of dive too deeply into it. But I do think kind of happiness is a is a tricky concept to kind of pin down because um, 
you know, is that kind of happiness in the moment? Is it sort of the uh, sense that you have a year later looking back and so on? And so I think, and you know, language is squishy and it's not, you know, completely specifically defined. But I think kind of generally speaking, kind of a better utility function and kind of gradient tread of time is that of fulfillment. Um, and uh, uh, and so I would say kind of the experience of doing Stripe was, um, it was not especially happy because we were sort of, you know, constantly sort of, you know, incredibly aware of all the ways in which the product was severely deficient and, you know, all the challenges we faced. And, um, I mean, it seems like there was no fintech category back then. Uh, it was just like two teenagers or, you know, <laughs> just, just over teenagers trying to compete with PayPal, which, um, you know, many people told us was not an especially kind of uh, promising avenue to pursue. Um, and uh, uh, so not especially happy per se, um, but it did feel kind of fulfilling. Um, like I enjoyed working with John um, and the kind of people we subsequently hired. Um, it was really fun working with the kinds of kind of customers we were serving. Uh, they were just sort of businesses doing all these kind of wonderful things uh, and they were kind of really smart people. Um, and it felt that like if, if it worked, it could be kind of consequential in the world. Um, and so I would say kind of, um, it, it, it sort of felt like, uh, I mean, you know, I don't know what it feels like to be sort of a scientist or something, but I'm guessing when you're sort of pursuing all, you, know, you have this kind of big question and you're pursuing all these kind of avenues to sort of try to better understand it. And I'm guessing day to day, it's sort of not especially happy because you know, most of your experiments don't work or whatever, uh, but sort of in, per perhaps there's some analog there in terms of um, it still feels like, it still feels in some sense meaningful. Yeah, there, in some sense, I mean, day to day, like you said, you just, you're just running around with your head cut off. Um, but maybe on a weekly or at least a monthly basis is just taking a step back and seeing like, what progress have I actually made? Because um, week to week, it's like 1% here, 1% here doesn't seem much, but from a monthly basis or you know maybe longer than that, it, it seems like there's movement. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And I think, um, I, I, I don't know, like, I think it's almost certainly a bad idea to sort of work on a company or to work on anything if, if you're like truly unhappy working on it, right? Um, and so the, the, there's kind of clearly some balancing act there. Um, uh, and I think, I mean, a lot of, well, there, there's sort of so many different sort of, um, difficult judgment calls to try to make in a startup, but, you know, of, of course, part of it is, um, uh, uh, like if, if, if something is making you unhappy or if it just doesn't seem like a, an especially promising avenue or it's not really working or whatever, mm -hmm. like your, your time has relatively high opportunity costs. Like you don't get to start that many startups in your life, right? Uh, and so kind of knowing when to sort of call it quits, I think it is actually, I mean, sort of, you know, in, in startup then we really extol and sort of uphold the virtues of sort of, you know, determination at all costs, you know, never quit and so on. And, and you know, that's clearly not the right answer uh, in that like sometimes you should quit. Uh, and so, um, so I think kind of what you're getting at is true and right, where I think there does need to be some sort of some happiness, satisfaction, fulfillment. Um, uh, There's a good book, of that, of that name, satisfaction, uh, which I recommend, um, uh, kind of week to week, month to month, uh, if you're if you're on the right trajectory. Yeah. Um, oh man, I wish I had known that um, I could have. You know, I remember when I was trying to when I was about to implement Stripe myself, um, I had these bad memories of trying to implement PayPal and like stacks of documentation and taking like five days to figure it all out. And so I sat down. I was like, it's. Because you guys are saying, oh, it'd take you 10 minutes. I was like, no way. Um, and it probably took me actually five minutes at that point. Um, and I was I was super happy. I mean, that's like, but um, maybe I should have sent you a review. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would have been great, especially if, um, if the review had sort of uh, criticism for us. But, um, <laughs> but no, it was, was uh, really it's, it's definitely helpful to have um, competitors with not very good products. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so... You were, in the early days, you were doing a lot of stuff yourself. Um, at some point, um, I guess two-part two, two part question. One is, what are the things that you weren't good at? Um, and then two, at what point did you hire someone to, what, what, what I um, assume is to do those things? Well, I mean, um, I, I'm not that good at most things, right? Um, I, and I see this in a non sort of false modesty, or, or I, don't, I don't mean to be kind of artificially self deprecating, but um, uh, sort of for almost anything that Stripe has to do, there are sort of people who are, who are, um, who are better at that than I am. Uh, and so I think to some degree, sort of the story of, say, you know, product market fit um, to, you know, say our current stage is, is kind of um, uh, implementing the recognition of that in kind of more and more areas. Uh, that said, um, I think maybe sort of embedded in that question is, you know, okay, well, acknowledging that you're probably not. 
that you're probably not the world's expert in uh, in any single thing. It's kind of in what order do you sort of uh, uh, re replace yourself? Uh, and for Stripe, um, uh, the sort of the the important thing that we were sort of most obviously not that great at uh, was kind of partnerships um, and you know sort of working with the various banks that we had to sort of get on board and and so on. Uh, and so kind of we made um in fact uh, uh, Jeff Ralston um, who um, is uh, here in the room today. Um, uh, I think sort of uh, w w was you know some combination of sort of very supportive and perhaps in the back of his mind sort of slightly pitying you know where he saw us kind of trying to get these partnerships with these kind of big banks um, uh, in place and we really weren't sort of getting anywhere very fast uh, and so he told us um, uh, that we had to hire. Uh, this guy, Billy Alvarado, um, and uh, he told us, just d d don't ask me questions, just hire this guy. Um, and uh, at the time, everyone uh, everyone at Stripe was an engineer, and so we just we kind of couldn't quite understand what a non-engineer would do. Um, uh, it's like, if you're not writing code, what else you know is there? Um, and uh, and so we were, we were kind of suspicious of this idea, and, and we sort of, uh, we went back to Jeff. We, we met Billy, and he seemed like a wonderful guy. We really liked him, but we, we couldn't quite get past this. Okay, but like, what does it actually, how does this work out in practice? And so Jeff told us that we should hire Billy and if it didn't work, or for the first few months or whatever, that um, if it didn't work out, Jeff would sort of go back and pay his salary. So it was kind of a zero risk move for us. Um, and um, and so, uh, and, and we did not have a whole lot of money at the time. So that was, that was not insignificant. So uh, we uh, we hired Billy, um, and uh, that was sort of an immediately trajectory changing event. Where you know previously when we gone and talked to a bank, I mean I don't know if they were literally doing this, but it certainly felt they were kind of pushing the security button under their desk. It's like why are these guys in my office? <laughs> um, and uh, and then suddenly things started to go kind of much more smoothly. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, Billy is still um, uh, with Stripe today, and uh, has been an enormously kind of a pivotal uh, uh, presence. Um, and so that was um, turned out to be very helpful advice. That is interesting. Jeff as an inflection point for Stripe. Never knew. Um, cool. So it sounds like you had hired actually people before Billy. Um, I guess the first, your very, very first hire, um, the third person between uh, with you and John was an engineer, I'm assuming? Like, well, he actually wasn't an engineer, but um, he joined Stripe and he started to become an engineer. Um, <laughs> so, um, like, he'd written a little bit of code previously, um, but uh, he, he joined and I mean, there was a lot of code that had to be written. It was a guy I, I'd known from college. He's actually also Irish. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, we, we had a lot of code to be written, and so he was the kind of person who, you know, would sort of survey the landscape and just do whatever it was uh, uh, was you know most important and required. Mm -hmm. And at that time, he was writing code, uh, and so off he went. Um, so, kind of the transition from pre-product market fit to post-product market fit. Um, a lot of CEOs, when they think back, this is like the one point in which they think, "Oh, I could have done that better." Um, so, how did you, how did you grade your success of that transition? Because um, a lot of it is, you know, just taking stuff, delegating stuff better, um, and doing other functions of the business. Um, so, what exactly was your transition like? And, you know, how, how would you, how how could I, if I was going in your shoes, tell that I was doing it well? Yeah. So I, I don't think I did it especially well, and I think um, uh, it kind of, you know, fortunately, sort of, you know, it worked out. But I think if if um, uh, if I was doing it all over again, I think we could have sort of accelerated ourselves by a year or two if, if we'd sort of gone about it in a somewhat more disciplined and kind of self-aware fashion. Um, uh, I think the, um, I, th I think one of the most kind of pernicious um, sort of uh, mental models you can have here is the kind of you are on some growth curve uh, and it is sort of your job to sustain or, you know, marginally inflect upwards or kind of somehow... Um, you know that what's it um is curling the sport where you're kind of uh, you know wiping the ice um, uh, while the whatever it is the weight uh, uh, proceeds uh, down along. It's sorry, I'm not Canadian, but um, uh, and uh, but kind of somehow you're kind of um, making kind of these very small interventions and perturbations on some underlying growth curve. Um, I, I think that's an easy mental model to have, and I think it's kind of uh, you know actively kind of uh, fallacious and mistaken. Uh, I think kind of a much better mental model to have is you're serving some market, and that market is I mean for it's relatively finite in size. I mean, you can always, you know, change the project and, and increase the market size, but sort of, you know, you can you can think of it as being finite. And then there's sort of the percentage of the market that you're serving. Um, and then, you know, whatever percentage you are not serving is kind of, well, you just haven't built the sort of 
go-to-market functions and organization that's kind of capable or, or at least has yet sort of brought the product to those market segments. And the kind of the growth curve or adoption curve is just kind of a function of of that go-to-market apparatus, but basically it's, it's, it's not some kind of cosmic trajectory, it's something kind of very much of your creation and under your control. And so what, I, what we did not do, but what I wish we did, uh, is kind of uh, maybe, well, whatever, you know, just after we launched, we, there's a whole bunch of kind of immediate scaling work we had to do, but say six months after launch, uh, that we should have sort of mapped out the kind of concentric circles of our market, uh, like maybe those kind of um, you know, very early stage startups that were kind of, uh, you know, our sort of initial uh, initial constituency. And then there's kind of all technical startups, but, you know, not necessarily very early stage. And there's kind of, I don't know, you, you keep going in these kind of successive increments until eventually you get to, say, all companies handling on online payments or something, right? And I'm gone and sort of figured out, okay, kind of what's the size of this market, sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of what fraction of them are we currently serving? What would it take to serve more, more and so on? And I think it's quite striking. You see that kind of when um, repeat founders uh, go and start companies, they almost invariably are willing to kind of build the organization, you know, post product market fit, they're almost invariably willing to kind of build the organization ahead of where things are today. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is exactly the right thing to do because they're th thinking, okay, I have the right product. Now let's kind of work backwards from, okay, what would the organization look like that was serving the entire market? And let's just start building that organization because, again, the growth curve is under my control. Um, and, you know, of course, it's not like 100% under your control, but I think it's much more under your control than... than um, than, than sort of people tend to think. There's also, of course, a difference here, a major difference uh, when, when you or I think about sort of uh, consumer versus kind of B2B uh, use cases. For consumer, it's a bit more, I mean, people don't necessarily know exactly what they want. You know, what's the... Uh, the, the market size for like a news reading app or a dating app or something. I mean, it's it's it kind of it depends a lot on the product. Like you know, maybe way more people should be reading news or something. Um, but for for sort of a, a uh, for uh, some service or a product that sort of serves a discrete, logical, concrete function uh, that sort of a set of businesses or, or entities definitively have or don't have, I think it's kind of much more um, sort of much more rational and much more mappable. Uh, and and you know, I, I partly had this epiphany when. Um, um, uh, Aaron Levy, who's the CEO of Box, um, uh, John and I eventually, we started out down Palo Alto, we moved up to San Francisco. I, I don't, well, Aaron Levy um, had Facebook messaged John, um, uh, and we'd never heard of him, and we hadn't heard of most people in Silicon Valley, um, but he'd Facebook messaged us like very early on asking to invest in Stripe. Um, and I think John didn't know who's this random guy. Um, and so uh, we, we never replied. Um, and, uh, uh, but then you know, we heard of Fox and we heard of Aaron and you know, we read his funny tweets and all the rest. Um, and so we moved to San Francisco and, uh, and we uh, invited him to our housewarming. I think it was the first time we'd ever met him. Um, and uh, uh, sort of, you know, like we're not very good at partying. Uh, and so, you know, by sort of 11 p.m. or you know, midnight or something, kind of everyone was going home. Um, but Aaron was still there. Um, and, uh, and Aaron stayed until like 2 a.m. I still remember kind of sitting in our front room telling us how much better it was to be building B2B software than consumer software <laughs> for this reason, uh, where sort of consumer software, it's so hard to predict sort of what people want. They don't even know themselves what they want. You're kind of, you're, it's such an amorphous space. Uh, whereas when you're selling software to businesses, you know, businesses are kind of, are, are mostly rational, are mostly, I don't, know, I don't know, the opposite of inscrutable is, scrutable, I guess. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and so you can sort of work backwards in, in a way that sort of, um, uh, it's just much more comprehensible. Uh, and so, um, uh, I, I still have this kind of, you know, it's like the angel and demon on your shoulder. I still have sort of, you know, 2 a.m. Aaron Levy sitting on my shoulder, sort of extolling the virtues of building software for, for entities that, uh, that know what they want. You've made the right choice. Uh, yeah, in some sense, there's a lot less variables. Or in consumer, there's a lot more variables to, to consider, and, and they're quite unknown. Um, I want to take a step back. You talked a little bit about, you know, thinking, about, thinking ahead about what your team is or what your company structure is going to look like. Um, how do you, maybe this is too big of a question, so maybe we can whittle it down a little bit, but how do you think about that? Like, like I'm sitting, if, I, if I'm starting a startup today, I'm close to maybe I'm product market fit, um, but before that stage, like, am I thinking about this sort of thing? Like, what should my team look like? What should my culture be? And stuff like that. I think that, um, well, okay, so, so, so pre-product market fit, um, uh, I mean, 
the goal is, is really is just to get to product market fit. And so I actually wouldn't bother thinking too much about all these kind of distribution mechanics questions. Now, you can get to product market fit sort of relatively quickly. And so kind of that pre-product market fit stage might only last six months. You know, you, you're not necessarily like Stripe where you're kind of in it for various reasons for, for sort of multiple years. Um, and so it may not last very long. However, until that point, I really think you should just be thinking about, okay, how do I get there? The main thing that I think companies screw up at the pre-product market fit stage um, is sort of... Um, uh, speed of iteration. I think, about, okay, well, what determines or, or kind of speed of fruitful iteration um, in that um, uh, sort of, uh, I mean, if you're kind of completely or if you're uh, repeatedly rebuilding your product, but sort of not in response to user feedback, I mean, th that's that's kind of far less likely to be kind of uh, uh, bringing you in sort of a, I don't know, um, in, a, in a productive direction. Um, but if you have some kind of meaningful, albeit perhaps small, sort of initial set of users, and you're rapidly uh, iterating in response to, to sort of their feedback and sort of observed behavior and so on, then I think that's like a, a really good spot to be in. And, and I think, again, at that juncture of pre-product market fish, it is kind of this, you should be sort of doing everything you can to tighten that sort of feedback cycle. Um, um, uh, there's a, a, a fighter pilot um, in, uh, who kind of revolutionized airborne combat in the U.S. in sort of the second half of the 20th century, sort of Korean War onwards, um, called Boyd. Uh, and he had this concept of the OODA loop, um, uh, which was sort of uh, a, a sort of a similar notion of the most, you know, previously people thought you wanted just like the fastest aircraft or, or sort of the, you know, uh, most sophisticated weaponry and so on, where he was all about sort of, no, you actually want aircraft that, uh, and, and sort of pilots and training that are really oriented around sort of the fastest sort of responsiveness and iteration to the kind of particulars of the situation uh, in a way that kind of subs subsequently went on to really inform sort of um, modern uh, aircraft design. And so I think you want to be like um, uh, one of these sort of um, these modern fighters uh, where you're sort of really optimized to respond as quickly as possible to sort of uh, rapidly evolving situations, um, again, in this kind of pre-product market fit stage. And so then from a hiring standpoint, I think, I think it should really be about, okay, well, what's going to uh, sort of, um, what's going to get you there faster? And I mean, I, th I think at an early stage, it's most likely, well, uh, sort of just people who will help you kind of build the product, but of course not too many because uh, I mean at some point like you might be able to do more, but you might actually be less responsive because you have a bigger team to manage or something, right? And so as an empirical matter, it seems that somewhere between kind of you know, two and ten, depending on exactly what you're building, is kind of the um, optimally responsive size. Um, uh, but it, but it, I, I think it, it really is about that sort of um, time from observed. Uh, um, sort of necessity or deficiency or just, you know, characteristic of your user's behavior to executed fix um, or improvement. Um, and whatever it is that kind of minimizes that. Is, is there, I mean, you say two to 10, which is helpful, but is there, um, are there observations or evidence in which you have hit the peak? Like you should not add an extra, like this extra person is going to be negative value add to the whole operation. Yeah, I mean, every every person, uh, every person. Um, well, startups in general involve all these kind of impossibly difficult sort of judgment calls in this kind of you know um, kind of high dimensional possibility space. Uh, and so, I mean, it'd be great if you could sort of collapse it down to kind of a, a fairly simple set of trade offs. I just I don't think you can. However, I think in principle, the calculation you're sort of trying to run is okay. And um, each successive person takes time to hire, and so slows us down in that regard, takes time to onboard, slows us down in that regard, kind of takes time to, I know, just kind of meld with the sort of culture and learn the stack and all that stuff. That, that also takes cost and time. Then involves subsequent ongoing cost of just like coordination and alignment and, and sort of, um, you know, you, you sort of now have, you know, you know the, the organization is now distributed across more neurons. Um, and so there's that kind of persistent tax. And that's not just necessarily a linear cost, but, it, you know, it can be sort of, you know, quadratic or, or, or something kind of given, you know, the multi-way communication problem. So you have all these cost to an additional person. And so the question is, okay, but this person can also help us just, like get more shit done, right? They can write more code or talk to more users or whatever. Um, and so it's kind of, is that fixed benefit um, uh, to sort of that additional person worth all these other costs? Um, again, with I think the ultimate arbiter being, will we be more responsive to what we're learning about our users given the presence of this additional person? And I think, you know, whether or not you will be depends on the complexity of the product and the complexity of the market and, you know, all that stuff. Um, um, but, um, but I think that's in principle the calculation you want to be running. Um, I've heard you said, and speaking of hiring people, I've heard you said, you know, the key qualities that you look for in a future Stripe employee is intellectually honest, um, cares a great deal, and just loves getting things done, which are great attributes because some people just don't fit in those categories. So it's good to have the separation there. How do you 
when you meet someone, how do you figure out this is the right person? Um, it's very hard, um, uh, and I, I, I wish I had a more sort of uh, sort of definitive rubric um, and kind of particular set of questions. Although if I had a particular set of questions, maybe you know they'd <laughs> you know they'd stop working because kind of people would learn how to uh, how to game them or something. Um, uh, and so, I mean, it, well, it, it's it's hard to fake just being smart, right? Um, uh, and so that one's kind of um, not not as hard to discern. Um, and uh, and I, it, it's oddly hard to fake being intellectually honest, um, uh, and and sort of the characteristic of kind of being able to see multiple sides um, uh, of a debate or an argument. Like there are so many kind of complicated questions where sort of the only thing that I'm really skeptical of is kind of certainty in either direction, mm -hmm. just because you know the, the, the questions are, are intrinsically sort of um, uh, you know, involve very contingent trade-offs. Um, it's also, it's not impossible, but it's hard-ish to fake just being nice. Um, like some, something we care a lot about at Stripe is, is just sort of people who are pleasant and warm and sort of just you know, make others happier as, as, a, as a result of their presence. Um, and, you know, if, um, well, you know, perhaps if, if you can fake that perfectly forever, you know, maybe that's fine, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> maybe that's <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, they're they're, they're all um, sort of uh, actually uh, they're, 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 there's no clear rubric for them, and, I, and I'm not sure that a clear rubric could even work. Yeah. Um, so you talk about move, like get people who help move the organization faster, if at all possible. Um, and I think there are two issues usually that start slowing down um, the organization as you start scaling. Um, just because each person adds just more complexity to the organization, but also I think one is asymmetric information, just people don't like are never on the same page. Um, and I think you've talked a lot about this, I think, and there's so everyone can Google around for lectures you've given on this on, you've done email transparency, you know, obviously, you know, having metrics transparent to the whole organization. Um, but the second problem to that is if you fix that, there's also this asymmetric interpretation problem, which is everyone's, there's this like black box function that how people interpretate, even if all the inputs are the same, the outputs are all different. And it's, especially at your scale now, it's nearly impossible to figure out everybody's function. Um, so when you're thinking about creating your organization and building it out, like how do you reduce that, reduce that noise um, and, and try to get everyone on the same page? Yeah. Um, uh... Well, the first thing is I, I wish we had actually um, uh, between, say, five and 50 people. Um, I think we were much too consensus-oriented. We, of course, weren't completely consensus-oriented. Um, uh, I mean, we couldn't have gotten anything done if we were, but I think we kind of biased too much in that direction. Uh, and again, if I was doing it, I, well, it, it's just not that efficient, right? Um, uh, and it's sort of, it's, it's necessarily not the case. Um, and so kind of, uh, you, like, you can sort of perhaps maintain some kind of fiction for, you know, more or less time, but, but sort of ultimately speaking, the, there, there is no way of sort of um, sustaining that. Um, uh, and I think that's a relatively common mistake, right? Um, because, you know, you almost invariably come from some, some kind of, um, you know, N musketeers for some small N um, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, kind of orientation where sort of there's no particular need for sort of formal decision making mechanisms or sort of, you know, uh, subsequent communication of said decisions or whatever, right? Uh, but then you kind of you hit 15 people and now there is. And kind of, I think companies don't adjust quickly enough to sort of that, that new necessity. Again, very much us included. Uh, and so I actually think we did relatively well on the kind of ambient um, uh, availability uh, of sort of context and information and so on, but actually kind of in some sense poorly at uh, sort of deliberate explicit communication of uh, of decisions, uh, decisions being, I mean, actual kind of tactical decisions or even, you know, bigger decisions like, you know, what are our priorities the next six months or things of that nature. Um, and so um, uh, the, the higher order piece of advice, and you know, perhaps I'm over extrapolating from our personal experience, but the higher order advice just kind of reflecting back would be to kind of 
uh, it's kind of like the pre and post product market fit thing, except it's actually about the size of the organization. Where kind of when you hit a certain size, again, maybe I'm just going to say 10 people for the sake of simplicity. Maybe it's a bit before, maybe it's a bit after. I think you need to kind of adjust more more deliberately to this kind of explicit communication model of sort of um, uh, of, of being sort of qu quite um, quite firmly non consensus based um, and uh, and sort of. Um, I mean, nobody, nobody likes the idea of sort of being hierarchical. That sounds pejorative, but like in some sense hierarchical. Um, sort of the top down, like it does move things f faster. Maybe some people don't like that, but yes. it does move faster. Th that's right. That's right. And, and there is this kind of delicate balancing act you, you want to um, sort of um, uh, orchestrate where kind of on the one hand, uh, you want to sort of really prioritize speed and agility, which in involves being kind of somewhat hierarchical because those are sort of efficient um, uh, sort of symmetry breaking mechanisms and ways to sort of uh, to, 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 to have shots get called. But on the other hand, you really do want people to have this kind of strong ownership mentality and, and real sense that sort of uh, they uh, th they can cause th things to change or identify problems or uh, sort of inject new ideas even in unrelated areas. And so it's this sort of delicate act where, I mean, you, you definitely can be excessively hierarchical. Um, uh, but sort of how do you sort of facilitate enough autonomy and agency um, but also not have things devolve into this kind of, um, uh, I don't know, sort of... Uh, Uniform morass of, 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 of sort of um, I don't know all these kind of of, of Brownian motion um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and 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 I think that's hard and requires all these kind of uh, you know ongoing sort of tweaks and nudges and I mean it's dependent on the personalities involved and, and all the rest and again I, you know I really wish there was kind of the the sort of wrote simple well just do X Y and Z and you'll be good um, but sort of if such X Ys and Zs exist um, you know uh, no one's told me yet. <laughs> If only there was a formula for everything. <laughs> um, so riding on the same theme, you know, as Stripe grows, you strike me as a company that does the opposite of most companies, which when, as they get bigger, they just slow down and they get less innovative. But for you guys, and it's hard to even keep up, like you're just pumping out new products and which seem to be successful to me, like Stripe Atlas, Stripe Press, Stripe Terminal, so and so forth. Um, so in the early days, you know, when there's just nine or 10 of you, if someone had a new idea, it's probably really easy to get to you. And, you know, then you guys would decide. Um, how has that changed over time to make sure that someone who's like six level, six degrees away from you, that a good idea actually gets to you? Um, and then how is that decision made to actually execute on, upon it? Um, well, I, I'm, it's, it's very nice to you say that it feels like we're getting faster as, as we get bigger because you know we're constantly sort of self-flagellating over how like freaking slow we are and um, uh, like paranoid about sort of I don't know degenerating into I don't know some kind of you know I don't know um, uh, sort of immobile stupor um, and so. Um, uh, to, to whatever extent we do get things done or, or appear fast, uh, I think it's largely because uh, we um, uh, we're, we're very paranoid in this dimension, um, and uh, and I think the kind of the the default outcome of companies, of course, as they scale, is to become sort of more ossified and rigid and um, uh, sort of. Um, uh, closed to new ideas and directions and things that contradict their prevailing orthodoxies and all of that. Um, as, as to how we kind of avoid that, um, uh, I mean, well, there's lots of kind of obvious things, like partly uh, it, it's sort of, I mean, having leaders who care about the rate of progress and, and just love seeing things happen quickly and, and lots of things of that nature. Um, I think maybe sort of deeper rooted is um, we try to be a kind of yes and culture uh, in that, um, uh, I mean, I, I personally love just ideas and potential things we could do. And I mean, you know, most of them are, um, or, I mean, no matter how good the idea is, uh, sort of, we should not pursue most ideas, right? Uh, even if independently, it could be a super successful company or something, but like there is a fairly finite number of things we can do. And so sort of you, you kind of, on the one hand, need to recognize that intellectually and just like not pursue most things, while on the other hand, enjoying the exercise of contemplating, well, what would it look like if we did it, right? Uh, and so, you know, one thing we do every year, for example, is we have this kind of uh, crazy ideas process, we call it, where we literally send a document to the whole company, um, a hackpot document uh, that, that's open to everyone. And uh, people can uh, sort of add ideas to it that they think are probably a bad idea, but if they worked, might be a great idea. 
Um, and it's very important that they have to be probably a bad idea. Because if they're like probably a good idea, then it, I mean, it's not that risky. And I mean, kind of by definition, we should probably do it. And so, you know, whatever, maybe we should just do it. Um, uh, and so it, p people like really self-censor a lot in most organizations uh, because they don't want to look stupid and um, they don't want to be sort of associated with just having all these like wacky bad ideas and so on. And so we, we try to be fairly firm that if you add ideas to this, it has to be probably a bad idea. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and actually a lot of cool things we've subsequently gone on and done first came from that process. Uh, Stri Stripe Atlas, um, you know, being one of them. Um, and, uh, and, and also we, we, uh, we sort of, um, helped Stellar get off the ground, this sort of cryptocurrency back a few years ago. And sort of that also, uh, sort of came from this process. Uh, and so that's one of the mechanisms by which we try to have a kind of yes and culture. Um, and I really think, um, uh, there, there aren't that many, uh, just as an empirical matter, um, there aren't that many large organizations that I think sort of re really do this successfully. Um, but I think that sort of the, the, the most successful larger organizations somehow uh, do succeed in sort of this um, uh, iterative, repeated, repeated process of kind of augmentation, uh, you know, Amazon and Google being kind of the most prominent examples, uh, where, you know, obviously when Google launched, there was no Gmail or YouTube or Android or Google Maps or you know, whatever. Um, and, you know, Amazon sort of uh, is, is kind of an even more conspicuous example in some sense of this kind of repeated attach of successful ancillary businesses. Uh, and so I think kind of, um, yeah, there's a very natural temptation as you grow to, I think, become increasingly close to this. I think it's very important to avoid. Cool. Um, so I have a couple more questions, and then maybe we'll have time to take questions from the audience. Um, one is, are, looking back, is there something, did you have a strong opinion of, you know, how startups should be run as a CEO that have just completely reversed um, because you're now the CEO? <laughs> question um another way to potentially put it is like what are what are things that you did where you're like i know for sure this should have been done and they just turn out to be a mistake <laughs> right. um well i already mentioned the um the sort of the consensus orientation one that we're going through right now um which is a, a quite sort of significant uh, divergence um is uh you know we, we were sort of fairly centralized um uh, up until sort of relatively recently i mean we had some remote employees from a pretty early stage but so by and large stripe was kind of concentrated in san francisco um uh last week we announced uh, our fourth global hub uh, and basically what we've decided to do is we're going to have kind of major sort of product and engineering uh, sort of efforts and teams and functions and all the rest uh, in San Francisco, also in Seattle, uh, also in Dublin, and also in Singapore. Um, and, and, and sort of these non-San Francisco locations are not going to be sort of, I don't know, operations offices or satellite offices or you know, places where we do kind of some localization and, and local market adaptation. We want to have kind of completely de novo new products that sort of become super successful started out of these offices. Um, and that's not the sort of standard, obviously, uh, kind of Silicon Valley pattern where sort of Apple and Amazon and Facebook and Google and all these companies uh, tend to be sort of highly concentrated in these um, uh, sort of very, I don't know, um, sort of monolithic corporate headquarters. Uh, and our thesis is that uh, is kind of several folds, you know, partly that kind of the availability of talent is becoming sort of far more geographically dispersed, uh, partly that sort of, um, you know, the Bay Area is becoming an increasingly untenably expensive location to locate, uh, and partly that sort of we really want Stripe to be global infrastructure that works kind of just as well in, uh, in sort of you know, Asian markets or in Latin American markets or whatever as it does for businesses in the U.S. And, and kind of the era of the Internet being a sort of predominantly North American or North American, Western European or whatever, the, the days of being kind of such a phenomenon are over. Um, and so I think that's sort of a fairly substantial break with kind of, you know, descriptive best practice of the past. Um, I mean, you know, we obviously think it'll work. I mean, we wouldn't do it if we didn't, but it, it is also kind of um, on some level risky. Like we don't have good, you know, prior examples to point to. And, uh, you know, I mean, there, there are some great companies in Singapore uh, like, like Grab and Carousel, but there aren't really any examples yet of sort of American companies establishing kind of major private engineering hubs there. You know, we're pretty optimistic it can, it can be done, um, but, but 
you know, kind of if it works, you know, we'll be you know, the first or one of the first. Cool. Um, last question. So in 100 years from now, what is Stripe going to be? What do you imagine it to be? Well, we're only seven years old, so that's a, <laughs> that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I mean, we're, we're trying to build this kind of um, this economic infrastructure for the internet and this sort of platform for globalization and kind of, um, I don't know, sort of uh, technological progress in the sense that uh, like it ought to be just as easy, easy to start a company in uh, in, in, in sort of um, you know Nigeria as it is in New York, uh, and it should be just as easy for somebody in Brazil to buy something uh, sort of from any of these companies as it is for for again somebody in in, in the Western world, um, and uh, uh, and it just seems so crazy to me that sort of that hasn't happened yet. Um, like I, it sort of feels that Stripe should have happened ten or twenty years before it did, and and kind of. Um, uh, I don't so much think that we're sort of pursuing this kind of unprecedented kind of path-breaking or um, um, uh, sort of uh, you know inconceivable idea uh, so much as kind of correcting a deficiency um, uh, in sort of um, a, a sort of a, a rip in the fabric of internet infrastructure um, and uh, and so anyway I, I think we still have you know at least five years to go in sort of uh, sort of correcting this inadequacy. Um, you know, so what happens after that, I'm not sure. Got it. In some sense, uh, in the future, all transactions should be digital, and they could very well just be all going through Stripe. Um, I mean, right now, like, in the U.S., someone was telling me, like, 80% of all Americans have done some transaction through Stripe, right? And yeah, so you, th th that's right. So in the last 12 months, um, uh, more than 80% of American Adults have, have uh, bought something from a from a Stripe business, at, le at least one thing from a Stripe business, um, w which is cool. And, and you know, it's not just the case in the U.S. Like in Singapore, where I was last week, you know, that that figure is about seventy percent, right? Um, uh, but I guess we don't think about it. Or, well, I think about it more in terms of um, the things that are possible uh, or get started, uh, as in it's kind of uh, we, we think a lot about the rate of sort of new firm creation, what companies are getting started, how successful are those companies, which markets can they serve, and so on. And you know, every now and again, we look back and we look at sort of the, the, those kinds of market coverage stats. But I guess that's not really what sort of um, what, what, what motivates us. It's more that sort of there are these businesses that should exist and or should be able to kind of offer their products and services you know, in these places where they currently can't. Um, and, and that's, I think, I mean, that's the kind of thinking that we use to kind of inform the product and, and, and that sort of is kind of the, um, the core I don't know, locomotion day to day. And then maybe the outcome of that is, is um, that I don't know, all, the, all these people get the benefit from it. All right. Thank you so much, Patrick. Cool. This is great. Thank you.